The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And hello, church family. It always feels so good to be with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in with us. You know, we hope you leave here today in the words of Emerson, not pushed by your problems, but led by your dreams. You know, we all have problems. I can be so bad at letting my problems just consume my thoughts, but may we be people who are led by the dreams that God has put in our hearts. Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you so much, and so do I. Today, with your generous gift of any amount, you can request the Living a Life Without Lack resources which includes a brand new two message audio series from Bobby, as well as a special Psalm 23 encouragement booklet, which outlines in detail each precious line from one of the most uplifting passages in the Bible. As you receive the life-changing truth of God's word about God's provision, abundance, and blessing from these resources, you will be filled with hope and faith that God loves to work powerfully on your behalf and that nothing is impossible with God. Call, write, or go online today, and for your generous gift of any size, we'll send you the Living a Life Without Lack resources, which includes a two-message audio series from Bobby, as well as the Psalm 23 booklet. We've prepared some incredible resources and tools to help you let go of the mindset of limitation and instead embrace God's fullness. Remember, because of Jesus and who He wants to be in your life, you can keep your focus off of what you don't have and like David, declare, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Well, hey, we're so glad you're here and no matter what you're going through, you know the great thing about church is this is a place where you can gather and encourage each other. So let's do that. Let's receive good, a good word from the Lord. Father, we love you and we thank you that you love us and you've forgiven us of our sins and renewed us and restored us. Every day you're transforming us and changing us and doing a good work in our lives and in our families. You wanna bless us, you're on our side. You call us your beloved and we thank you for that. We just remember your promises that even when we're going through challenges, God is good, that you always bring good in the long run and we can trust you. And Lord, we want you to know we love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
You may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in John 14. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Matthew 19, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Church family, we are called to do great things. All things are possible with our God. Amen. Why don't you swing, swing down chariot stop and let me ride? Swing down chariot stop and let me ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord. Calm and easy. I got a home on the other side. Swing down, swing chariot stop and let me ride. Swing down chariot stop and let me ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord. Working on the chariot wheel. He wasn't so particular about the chariot wheel. He just wanted to see how a chariot feel. Why don't you swing down chariot? Let me ride. Swing down chariot, stop and let me ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord. Calm and easy. I got a home on the other side. Swing, 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 swing. Why don't you? Well, 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 went down and he got on board. Chariot went up, up, and up and down that road. He was so particular about the movement on that road. He just wanted to lay down his heavy load. Swing down, chariot, stop it. You guys are having entirely too much fun. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. We're redefining church here. <laughs> what music we have with the kids, with the choir, with the ensemble, and with the orchestra. <laughs> Mercy. Would you pause a moment as we pray together? Lord, this morning we lift our praise in unique ways and in ways that express our joy before you this day, a day you have fashioned and made especially for us to enjoy life in your presence as we sing and as we live as partners in your wondrous story. We gratefully receive the gift of your forgiveness for our vain attempts to live together. May we turn and embrace your mercy and learn how to live graciously with one another. 
This morning we lift up those who are recovering from the hurricane winds and rains of these past days. We thank you for first responders and relief workers and pray that they may reach those in need wherever they may be. And Lord, we realize this morning that we live amongst heroes and patriots. And we ask, Lord, that there would be other heroes arise, even heroes among us, Lord, who have come back just recently, our junior high kids who went up into Los Angeles to serve you this past week, and others like Bud Thorine who've returned from Uganda building playgrounds with kids around the world. Lord, that's our legacy, and we want to continue it and be part of it. We continue to pray for the future of our two congregations as we take the next steps toward uniting. May your will be done as these important decisions are made. And this morning, we pray for Bobby as he brings your message for us, and may his very words align with our hearts and equip each of us to be your faithful people. Now we offer the prayer that your, ton, your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When I am gone, don't you cry for me. Don't you pray.
Abdiel, you rock. You do. You do. What a great morning of music. It's good to be back. I've been away for a few weeks, and I got to tell you, I went with my family for a family reunion in northern Colorado, and we rafted the rivers of northern Colorado. And I got to tell you, this is my little grandson, Jonah, in the front center. And Jonah is seven years old, and he is having the time of his life. While we were away, we had a conversation. And Jonah looked sad one day, and I said, Jonah, what's going on? He says, well, he said, I get my allowance, and I have to give 10% <laughs> to the church. And he says, that means it's going to take me longer to get that Lego set. And I go, Jonah, I said, I understand that would be hard. That's a sacrifice. But you know what that 10% does? When you give it to God's work, God does greater things and people experience relief and life that they wouldn't have been able to without people like you sacrificing and giving your 10%. Okay, Papa, I understand. So I will wait for my Lego set. But that's what we do. As we give to the work of the kingdom of God, God multiplies what we give, especially if we give it sacrificially. And so today we come, and as we ask the ushers to come forward, let me pray for our offering. Lord, we thank you for this day, for this time, for this worship, for this glorious music, and we anticipate your word to come to us through Bobby. And Lord, we pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings, that you would use them and multiply them for the good of your kingdom. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people together said, Amen. Amen.
One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible and possibly one of the most well-known ones is the one from Psalm 23, one that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. This is an incredible promise from God's word and believing that it's true can really revolutionize the way you see God and the way you experience provision in your life. Sometimes when circumstances aren't going our way, it feels like lack is our only option. But I wanna challenge you and encourage you otherwise. Though we might not be able to live a life without problems or challenges or testing, it is possible for us to experience a life of fullness, a life without lack. The Bible shows us many names for God, but one of my favorites is that he is called shepherd. A shepherd is present. A shepherd protects. A shepherd cares about everyone in his care. And it's his joy to love and generously provide for every need. Today, with your generous gift of any amount, you can request the Living a Life Without Lack resources which includes a brand new two message audio series from Bobby, as well as a special Psalm 23 encouragement booklet, which outlines in detail each precious line from one of the most uplifting passages in the Bible. As you receive the life-changing truth of God's word about God's provision, abundance, and blessing from these resources, you will be filled with hope and faith that God loves to work powerfully on your behalf and that nothing is impossible with God. Call, write, or go online today, and for your generous gift of any size, we'll send you the Living a Life Without Lack resources, which includes a two-message audio series from Bobby, as well as the Psalm 23 booklet. What Hannah and I are sharing with you today requires you to take action and change the way you think about who God is to you. We've prepared some incredible resources and tools to help you let go of the mindset of limitation and instead embrace God's fullness. Remember, because of Jesus and who he wants to be in your life, you can keep your focus off of what you don't have and like David, declare, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy path around the universe display. Sings my soul, my Savior God. 
Welcome. We're so glad you're joining us today. We want you to know that no matter who you are, we love you, that God loves you, and we hope that if you're ever in Irvine, you'll come down to this church and worship with us. If you have kids, bring them. We'll teach them the things of God. And uh, Hannah and I would love to shake your hand or give you a hug or, or do whatever, pray with you. Friends, we're gonna say this creed together. Would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. Well, we're in a series called Your Best is Yet to Come. And if you're doing life with Jesus, friend, let me tell you, that is true for you. It's true for you. It doesn't matter how sick you are, how old you are, how poor or broke you are. If you're doing life with the Lord, your best is yet to come. And we want to spend about four weeks believing this and instilling this, these promises that come from Scripture, that we are in this, this thing called eternal living in the kingdom of God. That no matter how dark and hard your life is getting, God will never leave you, never forsake you, never abandon you, and that the best is yet to come. Now today, the, one of the things I want to talk about is the importance of the struggle, and sometimes the importance of suffering. I'm a shuler, and so I have to start by telling you anything is possible in your life. <laughs> well, we shulers are possibility thinkers, and, and I, need, I need you to know that that really is true. That number one, there's two things that I want you to see today. Number one, that really anything is possible in your life. That when Jesus said anything is possible for those who believe in me, it's true. It's actually true that anything is actually possible in your life. But number two, and this is something we don't always like to hear in America or in, uh, in places that are affluent, that the journey there is arduous. The bigger the dream is, the greater the suffering and the greater the struggle. And these two things go hand in hand. That anything is possible in your life, uh, but very often those impossible things, people think are impossible, achieving them requires a long, arduous, a difficult journey, sacrifice. And uh, I want to talk about that today. First, let me just convince you that that struggle is worth it. It is worth it. Just like to be healthy means you maybe have to exercise a little bit every day the rest of your life. To be the kind of person that embraces possibilities and amazing things in your life means you're gonna struggle very often. But you'll look back and say, I'm glad I struggled. I'm glad that those struggles made me the person I am today. Um, I once heard a colonel say that in a fight, out of 100 soldiers, there are 20 that shouldn't even be there. They're not trained. Uh, they shouldn't be in the fight. There are 70 who are probably never even going to pull the trigger, and they're basically just targets for the enemy. There are nine who are true soldiers. And then there is one who is a warrior. It's that one out of 100 that I want you to be. It's that warrior for the Lord, that warrior that's willing to go the extra mile, that's willing to endure the suffering, that's willing uh, to really go for it. That's who I want you to be. I want you to not only embrace the reality and the truth of Scripture that anything is possible in your life if you're doing things with Jesus Christ, but also be willing to embrace the struggle, the suffering, and the difficult road that is ahead if you want to attain those goals and to understand that that journey is worth it. First, we do have to believe anything is actually possible. That is really true. If you have your Bibles, you can open with me to John chapter 14. John 14, Jesus says, this is a part of the departure sermon. And this is something Jesus needs his disciples to understand. It's kind of like the last thing he's telling them before the crucifixion. And he's talking to Philip 
And he says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. What works is he talking about there? He's talking about signs and wonders. He's talking about his miracles. This is important, that he begins, he's talking about walking on water, he's talking about raising the dead, he's talking about healing people. And then he says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. So anyone who believes in Jesus can do those signs and wonders and more. And they will do even greater things. Everyone say greater things. Greater. Look, if I, if I you know, pulled you over on the side of the road and said, can you do greater things than Jesus Christ? What would your answer be? No, right? But what would Jesus' answer be? Yes. This is so important. This is so, how often is Jesus looking at his disciples and saying, you little faiths? It was his like, Nickname for his disciples. He was just constantly trying to build their faith, build their faith, build their faith that they're not living in the kingdom of the earth anymore. They're living in the kingdom of God where anything is possible in their life. Anything. Pastors who teach that miracles don't happen anymore are pastors who have not seen what I have seen. I, I have prayed for a man in Thailand who couldn't walk for 10 years and he stood up and ran. We prayed for a woman who had a tumor on her neck and the tumor vanished. We went to a town where it hadn't rained for three months and we prayed for rain and it started raining as we prayed. I watched a girl who had white pants on on a missionary trip, was leading a bunch of teenagers. She was hit by a car going about 60 miles an hour, flung through the road, tumbled on the ground in Bangkok, got up, was totally fine and her pants weren't dirty. So I want to tell you something. Look, miracles happen. They just, for whatever reason, don't happen as much in the US. <laughs> you can speculate why, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you that anything is possible in your life. You can be healed of anything. Anything can happen in your life. Anything can change in your life. You can beat your addiction. You can save your marriage. You can recoup your kids. You can bring your family back together. You can start your own business. You can do anything, anything, if you do it in Jesus' name. And the thing is, that this is one of the main things that Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples. Believe it, first of all. Believe and fall in love with possibility. Fall in love with the what-if motif. Now, God doesn't always heal us, right? He's sovereign. God doesn't, we don't always get what we want, but it's always possible. And if we can wake up every morning and ask ourselves that question, what if? What if this could happen in my life? What if this was possible? And begin to live from that place. I believe that incredible things will begin to happen in your life. The danger, of course, though, is that when we do become possibility thinkers, we do embrace Faith, we do embrace the kingdom of God. We do believe in miracles that God can change even physics and bend the rules if he wants to. That the danger is the, the danger of denial. And I've seen this sometimes in many charismatic circles, which I've been very much a part of. It's, it, it's the, the pendulum on the other side, and it can be a danger. I remember once a friend of mine was talking about, you know, he grew up in a poor family, and um, we were very good friends, and, and he was saying how, you know, he lived with his mom and they were, they were a Christian family and they very often didn't have much. Sometimes they'd go to bed hungry or you knew things were bad because they would have potato soup, you know, every night for, for nights in a row or pancakes or something. And he was talking about how one day his mom was watching TV and it was a lottery commercial. And on the lottery commercial, at the very end, there was like a cartoon $100 bill and it said, Anyone can win. And then Benjamin Franklin in the dollar bill looks through and goes, even you, Karen. <laughs> and she believed that was the Holy Spirit. 
she said, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit like came through the TV and spoke to me that I would win the lottery. So, so they really believed that they were gonna you know, win the lottery. And so she went out and bought five tickets. And I know what you're thinking. If you're guaranteed that you're gonna win, why would you buy five? Just get one. <laughs> Just because you're a millionaire doesn't mean you throw away $4, all right? I don't know if you're hedging your bets. And, uh, and they lost. And later on, he was saying how he found out that that was a, like a, a thing that the lottery was doing. They took like the top 20 names of lottery players and would tag their name on the end, you know, in the hopes that they would do, you know, something like that. The good news is later on, she, she, she did very well in, uh, in real estate and created a business, but it was only after she paid the price. It was after she, she did the hard work. She got the dream in her mind and it took her years and difficult work and getting licensed and all the stuff, but she got there, but it didn't fall in her lap. It came through the struggle and the struggle itself helped her experience God in an even more real and profound way. Look, I want you to know anything is possible in your life. Jesus said it. Jesus said, anything, anything, anything is possible to them who believe. Those who believe in me will not only do the works I have been doing, but greater works. Anything they ask in my name, it will be given to them. But he also said, take up your cross and follow me. Look, anything is possible, but there is a price There is a price, and you have to be willing to pay that price to see those possibilities become real in your life. And very often, that price is a lifelong struggle for that thing. But I believe that that struggle is worth it, worth it, worth it, worth it. Be the one warrior. Be the one warrior that's willing to pay the price to to be that one guy that makes, or that one woman who makes all all the difference. You can be that person. Funny story, in Germany, back at the, in the seventh century, they believed that Germany was unconquerable for the gospel. And so there was this, there was this guy, and there's versions of the story, and I've never gotten to the bottom of it, but most of Europe had been Christian at this time, by the you know, 700s, so seventh and eighth century. And there was a guy named Boniface. And one story says that he was excited because the Pope wanted to Uh, launch missionaries into Germany and really go for it. But another version of the story says the opposite, that Boniface actually, who was English and was a a priest and a missionary, went to Rome to study under the Pope and hoping that he'd become a professor. Now just picture yourself, you know, you're English and you grew up in England and you go to Rome and you're eating pasta (laughs) and you're having wine, you know, priests can drink wine, you know, good wine. And uh, you're hanging out with the Pope and you're teaching. And the Pope says to Boniface, Germany needs the gospel, you're gonna go. And Boniface, for whatever reason, this is my favorite version of the story, is so angry, he's like, I'm just gonna go and die. I'm just gonna go and die a martyr. So he walks into the center of Germany to the Druid warriors, and he goes to like the heart of their country and culture to this place called the Great Oak of Thor. And this is like a giant world tree. Picture a thousand, 2,000 year old tree. And just as he's walking in, he's like, hasn't quite figured out how he's gonna martyr himself yet. But as he's walking in, he sees these druids do a child sacrifice on the tree of Thor. And the guy, so appalled, grabs an ax and starts walking down unannounced. Nobody knows who this guy is. He's dressed like a priest with an ax over his shoulder, walks into the middle of town and just starts chopping down the tree of Thor. Chops it down to the ground, turns it into a pulpit, gets on top and starts preaching the gospel to these people, thinking he'd be martyred. Little did he know the greatest uh, virtue in in their culture was courage. And so they see this guy do this amazing thing and and actually they all came to faith and were baptized that day. See, another cool part about that story is as he starts chopping, you know, Thor is the god of thunder and wind and all this stuff, and as he starts chopping, the wind starts to blow and a storm starts to, this is how the legend goes, and they all think, oh, Thor's coming down, is gonna mess this guy up, right? And instead, the wind like finishes the job and knocks the tree down. And then, of course, Boniface takes the tree and turn, uses the lumber to turn it into a church. And the reason I like that story is 
Everybody thought it was impossible to get the gospel uh, into Germany. It took a man who was willing to die to give everything to see what everybody said was impossible to be possible. Some things are actually worth dying for, friends. Some things really are. Some things are really worth suffering for. Some things really are worth the sacrifice. And we believe that this eternal life that we've been given, when we pay that price, we will look back and know it was worth it every time. You wanna do amazing things for the Lord? You can do anything. You can do anything. Anything is possible in your life. But just know it comes with a price tag. And that price tag is worth paying every time. This is what Jesus means when he's talking about the narrow road. Let me ask you a question. It's a language question. How much is a few? Well, let me ask you, how much is a couple? Two, all right. How much is a few? Three, four, five. Is nine a few? Probably not. Maybe if there's thousands of, of it. There's no right answer, by the way. I Googled it. <laughs> a few is a few. That's what it is. All right, just remember, look for that word, okay? A few. Just look for it when we read. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And everybody say many. Many, many enter through it. Many, many, many. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a, only a few find it. Now, I just want to clarify, I don't think the life he's talking about here is going to heaven. It's easy to see that. He might be. He might be talking about eternal life. But the life he's talking about, Zoe, it's life, full life. It's life in the kingdom of God. It's the kind of life that Jesus is living every single day and is trying to get his disciples to embrace. It's life in the kingdom of God, a miracle kind of life, a life that's overflowing with purpose and joy and passion and purp I already said purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, you know. Life, feel, being alive, feeling alive. And he says here that the way to that life is a narrow road that only a few find. If you want a really rich, awesome, fulfilling life, embrace the struggle. Even seek the struggle. Don't run away from it because whatever stands between you and all of the possibilities in your life is a struggle that's going to make you an even better version of yourself. When we go through the struggles, Christ within us is glorified. The, the power of Christ materializes, and we see he really hasn't abandoned us. He really can do anything in our lives. Amen? I recently heard an interview, amazing interview, that is not suitable for work. Lots of the F word. Don't worry, I've already listened to it for you. <laughs> I've shielded your virgin ears from the F word. <laughs> I'm being facetious. You guys hear the F word all the time. <laughs> they act like I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, you don't, you don't watch movies? All right. I'm digging a hole I can't get out of. So uh, this, amazing, this amazing interview uh, with Joe Rogan, who's a comedian on podcast, with a guy named David Goggins. You don't know the name, probably. David Goggins was or is an African-American man who grew up in an all-black community. His dad was uh, abusive. His dad was a criminal, um, stole, I think he dealt drugs, really abusive to his mom, would beat her up all the time, and then David would try and fight his dad. He tells a story of one time his dad beat up his mom and then dragged her down the stairs by her hair. His dad always saw the worst in him, always treated him like garbage. One day, his mom finally got the courage to leave the dad, and they moved to a very small tent of 10,000 white people in Indiana. And the reason I say white people is because he was the only black family in this very 
small community. On the second, I think it was the second week they were there, they had a parade. And it was like, you know, the American Legion, and then it was like, you know, Mothers Against Drinking, and then it was the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan marched in the town's parade. So this poor kid, as a teenager, was called the N-word almost every day, was bullied and ostracized. He had health problems that he faced. And fast forward to 24 years old. Here's a David Goggins, who is living in a poor part of town, a one-bedroom apartment. He's making 1,000 bucks a month, and his rent is 850 a month. And he's an exterminator, and he weighs 300 pounds. And he's just doing life, and he's depressed, and doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And one day, he sees on the Discovery Channel a show about Navy SEALs. And he says, he asks that question, that what if question. He looks at it and thought, what if a guy like me, who, by the way, he was terrified of water and swimming. Terrified. Like he would like, if he had to get in water, he'd like be up all night thinking about it. He's like, what if a guy like me, who weighs 300 pounds and makes no money and who, you know, hates water and, you know, out of shape, could become a Navy SEAL. So he goes down and he starts calling recruiters and they say, you, you don't meet the physical you know, limitations to be, you know, to be in this branch of the military. And, and finally one guy says, well, maybe you can make the reserve. So he goes to a reservist and the reserve says, we'll let you in, but you have to weigh 190 pounds and you've only got three months um, till the qualifiers come. And he just said, forget that. I can't, I can't lose whatever, over 100 pounds in three months. And, and make these qualifiers. So he says the next day, you know, he was an exterminator and he was at a, I can't say the name of the restaurant, but it is a seafood restaurant that serves red lobsters. <laughs> so he's there and he said he's at like some, some part of the restaurant and he said he didn't, hate, he didn't like cockroaches much, you know, and he hit the mother load. He said the mother load of cockroaches, and then there were rats as well. And he was standing there with him, you know, as himself, and he said something, he's like, he just looked at all of this, and he said, this is my life. This is my life. Nobody's coming to help me. Nobody's coming to save me. This is my life. And he said something snapped. He left his exterminator thing and his van and everything, and he said he just started training like crazy. He, he would run, he would get on his bike. One of the things he had to train was his mind because he was so afraid of water. When he was too exhausted to exercise, he would just go like sit in the pool to try and get over the fear of water. And he just did this. He said, what, what happened to me was like, anything that was horrible, anything that sounded awful, he's like, if I, if I saw something and imagined that would be absolutely horrible to do, he's like, I just do it. I just do it. I just realized if I was going to get a better life for myself, I had to love what was horrible. Was like, so if I was looking outside and it was like three in the morning and it's snowing and I would think, oh, it would be horrible to run in that. He's like, I would just get out of bed and go running. And it was this type of thing. Guess what? He became a Navy SEAL. He's the only guy to go through three hell weeks in one year. One of the guys in the hell weeks died. I mean, it's that horrible. Hell week is that horrible. And he just continues to this day to live this philosophy. When, when he was a SEAL in 2005, a bunch of his um, mates died in a helicopter accident in, in Iraq. He did several tours in Iraq and Afghanistan as a SEAL, and he felt so bad for these families that he wanted to run the Moab 240. Now, the Moab 240 is a run, I believe it goes through Death Valley. It's 240 miles of running. He'd never done a marathon in his life. And the, the guy at the, the, who allows people to run said, I'll let you do this, but you have to qualify, and the qualifier is in five days, and it's a 100-miler. He was like, I'll do it. Now, again, he said he'd never run more than 10 miles in one thing ever in his life. And so he and his wife, they go to Walmart, and they buy a lawn chair and some Myoplex and Ritz crackers, and he gets out there, and he starts, he thinks, I can do 100 miles. By mile 70, which is still a lot, I mean, that's, what is that, three, uh, almost three, uh, Mar three marathons? I couldn't remember the word marathon. <laughs> it's morning, guys. 
what is that, three marathons, right? So he, he uh, at mile 70, he's completely out of energy. He falls into the lawn chair and he, he can't reach the bathroom. He sees like three of his girlfriend. He, I don't know if I can even say this, he soils his pants in the lawn chair, urinates blood, and she's like, we gotta get you to a hospital right now. And he just looks at her and he's like, no! So he gets out of the lawn chair. I'm not recommending you do this, by the way. He gets out of the lawn chair and begins to just hobble around. She's like trying to help him. And, he, and she's like, you're not gonna make this. And he said, something happened at mile 81. Some, he said, something in my spirit and my mind and my body just snapped. And all of a sudden, I finished from mile 81 to mile 100 at a 10 minute pace. <laughs> and he qualified. Then he qualified for the Boston Marathon a week later. And now he runs about 400 miles a week. He set the record for pull-ups, 4,030 pull-ups. Look, all of this to say, when I listen to this, when I listen to this interview, I recognize, I said a prayer for this man. And I said, Lord, I pray that David Goggins would know you. Because if this man knows the gospel of Jesus Christ and applies this kind of passion and this kind of understanding of the value of the struggle to his faith, think about what he could do for the gospel. Think about what he could do. Imagine he applied that to his family. Imagine he applied that kind of passion and sacrifice to his kids, to his church, to people suffering in his city. Imagine he applied that kind of passion and willingness to suffer. This man would be a history maker and a miracle worker. And friends, I want you to know, anyone can be that way. Anyone can be that way. Anyone can not only believe that anything is possible, but anyone can also take up the cross and follow the Lord to victory. I want you to know that God wants to do great things in your life, but I will not bait and switch you and promise that you're gonna win the lottery. I will promise you that if you're willing to pay the price, you're gonna do amazing things in your life. And no matter how old you are, no matter how unhealthy or sick you are, no matter how broken your family is, or broken your relationships are, or broken your ministry or business is, God's not done with you. Your best is yet to come, but don't run away from the narrow path that leads to life and victory, amen. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you love us and that you're not gonna let us uh, you're not gonna let us lose our passion or our dreams or the visions or the things that you've given for us. You, you want us to fulfill incredible things with our lives. So we just pray, Father, that you give us a drive and a desire to walk the narrow path uh, so that we can do great things for the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. The Hour of Power with Bobby Schuler is an outreach ministry of the Crystal Cathedral. May the peace of Christ be with you.